recently I had to learn about Bluetooth low energy and the natural first question I had was how is it related with normal Bluetooth? And going down this rabbit hole, the first hole was the naming schemes. So original Bluetooth now is called colloquially Bluetooth Classic, but it can also be specified by its speed, which could be Bluetooth BR for basic rate or Bluetooth EDR for enhanced rates. Bluetooth low energy now most likely goes as shorthand for BLE, and in older documentation, they might consider it as Bluetooth Smart. Now, the similarities between the two standards are that they're both 2.4 GHz signals, and they're both low-power devices. But other than that, they're pretty m much different standards. And it's they're such different that they don't work with one another. Bluetooth Classic can't talk with Bluetooth Low Energy and vice versa. So your phone actually has to support both those standards. So they have to have both pieces of hardware to make this happen. Now, the next question I naturally had was, why would I use Bluetooth Low Energy? Bluetooth Classic's been around since 1999, while Bluetooth Low Energy's been around since like 2010. So at least for a while, there just wasn't as much wide support. Not so much the case now. But what Bluetooth Low Energy has going for it is, it's low energy. And it accomplishes this by primarily just going to sleep. When, when the Bluetooth low energy device is not sending data, it is going to sleep. And the time between packets is called this connection interval. And you have to determine with the other Bluetooth device, you have to come up with the connection interval that will best accommodate your power requirements. Other things to fine tune the low energy aspect of this is the packet size and the baud rate, each which can increase the power consumption or decrease it the higher you go with either of these. Other ways that Bluetooth low en energy distinguishes itself from Bluetooth Classic is by the way it can communicate. So Bluetooth low energy can do the standard pairing, which is a one-to-one -one communication. So that's your standard like headphone scenario where the phone sends up data to the headphones and the headphones can send commands back to the phone. But now we actually have the ability to broadcast the data. So this is a one-to-many communication. And with this, you can have new scenarios that couldn't be possible before. So you can have something like a Bluetooth beacon, which for example is something you say in a subway where you can have a little Bluetooth device that emits to everyone small packets of information, say schedules or arrival times and stuff like that. Or you can do the opposite where you have your phone and you want to send a message to all your lights to turn them off. You instead of trying to pair to each individual one, you could just broadcast an entire message and then allow them to figure out how to get the message out to all the devices. And this figuring out how do you get the message across all the devices is this new kind of paradigm with device networking communication. And I'm not gonna get too far into this, but this is called mesh, a mesh network. A mesh network is a way to connect multiple devices up in an uncentralized way. Normally, network typologies involve a router that knows where everyone is, so when you send a message to your router, it will automatically reroute it to the needed device. But in a mesh network, it's up to all the nodes on the network to get the message to where it needs to go. So in this example, if H wants to talk to G, what H would do is it would broadcast its message and it wouldn't get to G until F picked up the message and then rebroadcasted it. At that point, G would get it. And what BLE does that's quite smart is it's what's called a controlled flooding system. So it allows the mesh network to have roles. So different devices that are power conscientious, like these low power nodes, can operate differently than these relay nodes that have to be on longer and to rebroadcast the messages. Lastly, 
uh, what makes Bluetooth Low Energy very attractive is that it's very flexible. Previously, with Bluetooth Classic, you were limited to these profiles. So you would have a Bluetooth device that did uh, a human interface device, like a keyboard or a mouse. Or you'd have a Bluetooth device that did audio. But now, you can basically have custom so-called profiles. They do it a little differently in BLE, but it allows you to completely customize the kind of device you want. So you can have, you know, we have a whole breed of new devices like smart toasters and stuff like that, which there's no standard for, but you can make it up. You can make your own protocol within the Bluetooth LE stack. A few misconceptions that I had going to this was that BLE, because it was low energy, that it couldn't output all that much data. And for the most part, that's not true. BLE 5 can do 1.4 megabits per second, while Bluetooth Classic can do around 2.1 megabits per second. And for the most part, that's good enough. And the other misconception I had that it wasn't built for audio, but with the latest Bluetooth 5.2, they have new hardware called LC3, which allows for hardware decompression and compression to make streaming a lot more efficient. But with both of these things, you have to be worried about what's your user group because these are the latest features. So only recently our phones coming out with, say, this 5.2 standard. So if you want to reach the widest group, you might have to limit your thought put to lower speeds, say, the 4.2 standard. So those are some considerations. So back to one of the original questions, why choose BLE over standard Bluetooth Classic? And it really comes down to it's more power efficient. You have a very configurable data type and how the data is transmitted. You have more ways to communicate. And you still have a fairly good throughput. So that's the end. I'm planning to do some more videos specifically involving the SCMWB. Uh, but until then, bye.